I thought tonight, uh, since this is before Hanukkah, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Hanukkah. And Hanukkah historically is a very, very fascinating holiday because the reasons for the holiday of Hanukkah seems to have changed and evolved with the passage of time. There's a Hanukkah version one, and we'll see there's a Hanukkah version two, and then later Hanukkah became a synthesis <coughs> of two different ideas. Uh, first, we know, of course, the basic story of Hanukkah, uh, Eretz Yisrael uh, was under the rule of the uh, di dynasty of Seleucus. Seleucus was a successor to Alexander the Great. And uh, when Alexander the Great died at the, in his early 30s, supposedly the legend has it that he was crying. They had no more worlds to conquer. Uh, but his empire was divided among four generals. And for purposes of Jewish history, only two of those generals are significant. Ptolemy. P-T-O-L-M-E-Y, who ruled over Egypt and North Africa, and Seleucus, who ruled over Syria and Turkey. And as you can imagine, if you envision a map, Eretz Israel is right in the middle. And for several hundred years, there was a constant political football in which there were wars between the Ptolemaic dynasty and the Seleucid dynasty, and Eretz Israel was sometimes under one uh, rule and was sometimes under another rule. But the story of Hanukkah, which took place in the second century BCE, around you know, 180, 185, is situated at a particular junction in time when Eretz Yisrael was being dominated by the Seleucid dynasty in Syria. So when we talk about Greeks, we don't mean Greeks from Greece. We're talking about the Greek empire from Syria. And the king, the villain of the Hanukkah story is of course Antiochus. Now, what's interesting to know, Antiochus went by the name which he gave himself, Antiochus the Great, Antiochus uh, Epiphanes. Behind his back, people called him Antiochus Epimanes, which actually means Antiochus the Insane. Uh, and he probably was crazy, even in a psychological way, just as Herod. Herod was, on one hand, a paranoid schizophrenic, but on the other hand, he really wasn't paranoid because everybody did hate him. Paranoid is you have a delusion that everybody hates you. In the case of Herod, it was actually true. So in some ways, uh, it wasn't even a delusion. Well, Antiochus was somewhat of the same. But one has to realize that Antiochus was actually unique. He was the first ruler in the ancient world who promulgated anti-religious decrees against the practice of Judaism. This is, people don't always, don't always realize this, because we had plenty of villains before Antiochus. We had Paro in Egypt, and we had Nebuchadnezzar in Babylonia, and we had Achashverosh, you know, with Haman, and, you know, plenty of bad guys. But interestingly enough, the bad guys prior to Antiochus did not specifically target the Jewish religion per se. Nebuchadnezzar did not destroy the temple because it was uh, in order to attack the Jewish religion. He, he destroyed the temple uh, because that was part of his subjugation and conquest of a rebellious Jewish nation. Antiochus was very different. Antiochus wanted to create a homogenized society. He wanted to create a society where people would adhere to Hellenistic culture, but literature and science and mathematics, even in athletics. And he saw the Jewish people with their distinctive observances as a thorn in his side. And therefore, he was actually, he was not an anti-Semite in the Hitlerian or the Haman sense. He was perfectly willing to give Jews full political and social and economic rights as long as they would go with the game, go with the plan, and not keep their unique religious observances, such as Shabbos, Kashras, Bris Milah, etc. So, in fact, the, the Achronim say that is why Hanukkah is celebrated differently than Purim. On Purim, we are obligated to make a festive meal. On Hanukkah, although people you know, make latkes and stuff, there is no obligation to make a meal. We celebrate Hanukkah by lighting candles. And the difference is that the danger of Purim was a danger to our physical survival, so we celebrate by physical ceremonies. 
Hanukkah was not a danger to our physical survival. It became a war, but remember, it only became a war because of the determination of the Maccabees not to compromise in their spiritual pursuits. Had we simply compromised our spirituality, had we assimilated, there would have been no war, there would have been no violence at all. So Hanukkah was not a threat to the body. Hanukkah was a threat to the soul. And as a result, we celebrate by Nechot, which are described as the human soul, Ner Hashem, Nishmat, Nishmat Adam. The physical danger, delivery from physical danger is celebrated in a physical way. Delivery from spiritual danger is celebrated in a spiritual way. Now, the thing to keep in mind is that the actual majority of the Jewish population actually went along with Antiochus. And indeed, they were Hellenized before Antiochus even issued coercive decrees. The Chashmonayim, this family of courageous Kohanim who organized a guerrilla rebellion against the most powerful military force in the world, were not only fighting against overwhelming odds in terms of the enemy, they did not have the support of their own people. The average Jew in Eretz Israel at the time looked at the Maccabees as fanatics, looked at them as obstructionists, looked at them as not living in a modern progressive world. You know, why can't you be a nice first century BCE, you know, modern person, so to speak? So you can imagine how demoralized the Chashmanoim actually would have been because uh, they were fighting against uh, really uh, amazing odds, overwhelming odds, and they did not have the support of the Jewish population, most of whom were Hellenists and the like. The whole idea of the Stukim, the Sadducees, are really a, a Hellenist branch. Uh, the Asher, certainly the aristocracy, the wealthy, politically well-connected Jews, were all Mitzyavnim and the like. So, Mitzyavnim is what? Mitzyavnim are Mitzyavnim is Yavan. Mitzyavnim means... Uh, Why did that happen? Huh? Why did that happen? Well, well, there was something. Cert certainly the coercion of Antiochus had some role, but, but as I say, many Jews Hellenized irrespective of, of like any coercion. The, the enlightenment at that time? Huh? That well, yeah, basically it's the same reason why there are so many assimilated Jews in America. Uh, you know, Hellenist culture was very rich in many, many ways. It was, there was art, there was science, uh, there was literature, uh, there was music. It was very attractive. It was a way to be politically well-connected and to be respected in general society. So, and Jews were given freedom, meaning to say, they were given freedom to participate in all of those elements as long as they don't you know, accentuate their distinctive identity. So once again, the parallel to a society like America or Western civilization generally is very, very apparent. The only thing Antiochus added was Antiochus added the element of coercion, meaning go with the plan or I'll kill you. That was a bit of a unique uh, twist. But overall, Hellenism was uh, a factor and a force that was working totally independent of Antiochus. Antiochus accomplished 90% of what he wanted to accomplish before he made his decrees. But there was that stubborn 10% or even less that was not, was not giving in. So what happened at some point was that the Maccabees, by the way, just again, a semantic difference. What is the difference between Chashmonaim and Maccabees? Right? We refer to the group of, of Jews that were rebelling by those two names. And they're usually interchangeable, but, but there, there, are, there is a technical difference. And that is the Chashmonaim refers to the particular family of Matis Yahu, the Kohen Gadol, and his descendants. And why are they called Chashmonaim? Again, there are two origins for Chashmonaim. In Tehillim, there's a word called Chashmanim, and Chashmanim means nobility, aristocracy, and the name of this family, this family were, were righteous people, and they were known as nobility of spirit, so Chashmonaim is a corruption of the Hebrew word in Tehillim, Chashmanim, in fact, if you have a good liturgical memory, in the song Ma'os Sur, we refer to Chashmanim, but that's taken from Tehillim. I thought that was just because of Brian. Well, that's true also. That's maybe what, but, 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 but Chashmanim is a word that appears in Tehillim itself. 
Uh, others say Chashmonaim is from the town of Chashmona, which is a town, was a town in Eretz Israel. And although Matasio lived in Modi'in, which is not the same as modern Modi'in, we lived in Modi'in, but the origin of the family was Chashmonaim. So Chashmonaim is specifically refers to the family of Matasio, his sons, and their descendants, who were the leaders of this revolt. Makabim is a term for the entire army. In other words, all of the Jews that joined in the struggle were called the Maccabees, the Maccabim. And uh, what is the origin of the word Maccabi? We have two interpretations. Uh, some say Maccabi, it's not the health service here, uh, the Kupat Chalim, uh, but it uh, refers to an abbreviation, Mi Kamocha Ba'elim Hashem. Who is equal to you among the gods? HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and it is said that the Maccabees had this on their banner, on their flag, that they went into war even against the Yevanim that were very, very, very powerful because they had bitachon in Hashem. Others say that the word Maccabim comes from the word Makevet. Makevet in Tanakh is a word that means a hammer, and it refers to their military prowess in smashing the enemy. Makevet. Ah, so the problem is, uh, there's a difference in how you spell it. Mi kamocha ba'ilim Hashem is mem chaf bet yud. Makevet is with a kuf. And the problem is, here's the following. Uh, the Sefer HaMakabim, which I'll discuss in a moment, uh, we only have in Greek. We do not have in Hebrew. Any Hebrew translation is a modern translation. So consequently, when, when we get the word Maccabees, we don't know how it was intended to be spelled in Hebrew, and uh, there's no reason that's given for the name. So as a result, the commentators have a bit of a disagreement. The Sefer of Maccabim, we're not really sure. Was it originally written in Hebrew and then translated in Greek, or was it originally written in Greek? We don't know. The one thing we know for sure is any Hebrew translation of the Book of the Maccabees is a modern translation, and that was made from the Greek. We do not have an original Greek version of the Book of the Maccabees. Since it's not within the authoritative text, yeah. who are we assuming wrote it? Just because it's in Greek, who wrote it? Right, so I'll, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. Now, uh, in the course of this guerrilla war, at some point the Ivanim gained custody of the Beit HaMikdash. We know this. Interestingly enough, the date that they gained custody of the Mikdash, which they profaned by Avodah Zorah, by sacrificing pigs to their idols, by even creating prostitution in the temple, they actually gained custody on the 25th of Kislev. It's very, very fascinating. The day that a few years later became Hanukkah was the actual day that the Beis HaMikdash was seized by the Yavanim and corrupted and contaminated and desecrated. And the battle went on for three years. And three years to the day, on the 25th of Kislev, the Maccabim regained the Beit HaMikdash. Uh, they dedicated the temple, the Hanukkah story, etc., etc. Eventually, the Chashmonayim established their own monarchy, which served as an independent Jewish state for around 150 years until the Romans uh, came in. Again, we'll discuss all of this. And like now, what are the sources of the Hanukkah story? How do I know what I'm saying? And uh, what are the sources? So the earliest source for the Hanukkah story are in the books that are either called Sefer HaMakabim or sometimes they're called Sefer Chashmonaim. Now, they are not part of Tanakh. They are not part of the Kisvei HaKodesh because they date from an era which is after prophecy. The biblical period of Tanakh ends at the beginning of the Bayit Sheni. Chagai, Zechariah, Malachi are the last prophets. And chronologically, the latest events in Tanakh are in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. And the, the last Persian king that is described in Tanakh is Daryavesh Hasheni, Darius II. And Alexander, which initiated the Greek period, is already outside of Tanakh. Tanakh does not explicitly talk about the Greek period, except prophetically in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, which dates from the Babylonian exile, 
uh, if you remember, if you ever looked at this, in Perek Yud, Yud Aleph, and Yud Bet, there is a long story about the wars between the king of the north and the king of the south. And most Mephorshim understand that this is a prophecy about the wars between the, the uh, Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt and the Seleucid dynasty in the north, and the victories of the king of the north refers to Antiochus, etc. But that's only by way of prophecy, and as a result, the verses are very obscure. Uh, but chronologically, the whole Tekufa of the Greek uh, rule over Eretz Israel is post-biblical. It is not in the Tanakh at all. Uh, so the book of the Maccabees is what we call the Apocrypha, or in the Hebrew they are called Svarim Chitzonim. So among the Svarim Chitzonim is something called the book of the Maccabees, Sefer HaMakabim, or Sefer Chashmonoim, and there is actually four books of the Maccabees, four. Maccabim Aleph, Maccabim Bet, Maccabim Gimel, Maccabim uh, Dalit. Uh, we do not have uh, the Hebrew original of these books, nor do we even know if there was a Hebrew original. Scholars are divided over whether there was a Hebrew original. Uh, the, the earliest versions we have are Greek versions, but they are very early. They were written shortly after the rebellion in around 185, 190, certainly before the year uh, 200. BCE. Uh, yeah, B BC, BC, we're talking about BCE. And uh, we don't know who the author is. The authors are, uh, are anonymous. Uh, and uh, let me just describe what each book is because indeed uh, they're very, very different. Uh, first of all, in terms of the history of the revolt and the establishment of the Hasmonean dynasty, the only relevant history is in Maccabees 1 and 2. Sefer HaMakabim 3 and 4 is actually nothing to do with the Maccabees at all. They are philosophical treatises about the meaning of life and whether one should be prepared to give up their life. These, these were reflections that maybe were precipitated by the wars against Antiochus, but they are not historical books at all. The history of the revolt against the Yavanim and the reclamation of the Beit HaMikdash and the establishment of the Asmonean <coughs> dynasty are in Maccabees 1 and 2. Maccabees 1 has much more history than Maccabees 2. And it's interesting that they have a different emphasis. It's very, very, very fascinating. Uh, Maccabees 1 details, in really extreme detail, every single military strategy of how this small group of guerrilla revolutionaries defeated the mighty Greek Empire. So the emphasis in Maccabees 1 is on military strategy. Of course, they talk about Hashem, they talk about praying to Hashem, but it actually emphasizes, so, you know, we know the Hanukkah story in very general terms, but if you really wanted to know every single battle, every single skirmish, every single technique that the Maccabees used, Maccabees 1 is kind of a West Point, you know, uh, textbook. And in fact, I believe that it's looked at when they study ancient battles, uh, which they do in West Point, I assume, and other military, maybe even here in Eretz Israel, maybe especially in Eretz Israel. They actually study the Maccabees because, you know, those of you who are old enough to remember the Vietnam conflict that the United States was engaged in for many, many years, and, you know, part of the amazing issue was that here you have the United States, uh, the most powerful army or you know, at least certainly up there, one of the most powerful armies in the world, constantly getting stymied and, you know, defeated in some ways by this, you know, this group of people that didn't have shoes and didn't have food, but uh, they were just a small groups of guerrilla warfare. But in truth, that's part of the lesson of military history, that uh, even conventional, the best conventional army is going to have a lot of difficulty against these small groups of guerrilla warfare, and Maccabees 1 makes that point over and over again. So Maccabees 1 is a book that details military strategy. Maccabees 2 focuses on what you might call spiritual resistance. It talks about martyrdom, the famous story we know in the Hanukkah story about Chana and her seven sons, all of whom died by Antiochus because they would not bow down to idols. That is what is emphasized in Maccabees too. It's a very interesting perspective. Who are the heroes? You know, what do they say? Donald Trump once remarked 
was not a nice thing to say at all about uh, the late Senator John McCain. That uh, he said he didn't think McCain was a hero because he says heroes are the people who don't get caught or something. You know, McCain was uh, was a prisoner of war for five years. So Trump says the heroes are the guys who don't get caught. Whatever it's a typical Trump uh, type of comment to make. But you see, in Maccabees one and Maccabees two, you actually have these two models of heroism. In Maccabees one, the hero is the victorious warrior, and in Maccabees two. The hero is the person who dies al Kiddush Hashem. Even in the Holocaust, to this day, you know, um, Yom HaShoah, Yom, Yom, uh, Yom HaZikaron, I'm sorry, I get my names mixed up. Yom HaZikaron, right, right. Yom, Yom HaZikaron is, is for the Chayolim of, 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 of the IDF, but Yom HaShoah uh, is the anniversary of the fall of the Warsaw Ghetto. It's in the month of Nisan. And although that is certainly a date that's deserving of commemoration, but there's a long bit of convoluted history why that date was chosen for Yom HaShoah, because uh, in the aftermath of the Holocaust, when the state of Israel was established, there was a certain pride in the new Jew, the Jew that would not be a victim, the Jew that would not be led like sheep to the slaughter, the Jew that could fight, the Jew that was tough. And as a result, there actually was a certain embarrassment among some segments of Israeli society about what they thought was the passivity of the Jews who went like sheep to the slaughter. So as a result, the, from that way of thinking, the real heroes of the Holocaust were only the Warsaw Ghetto people because they're the ones who actually fought. So there was a bit of controversy. Some said, besides the fact that in the month of Nisan you don't have uh, sad days, they thought that this was a bit of a denigration for the spiritual sacrifice of those who gave their lives al Kiddush Hashem. Now, the truth of the matter is, this is... The name of the day yeah. is Yom HaShoah. Vahag 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 that's correct, that's correct. The word Gvura is very, very, so is very, very telling. Right. That's 100% correct. So, but the truth of the matter is, in reality, this should not be an either or type of situation at all. It is a false dichotomy. There are many different ways of heroism. There is heroism in achieving victory and there's heroism being willing to die for your cause and everybody's a hero. But I just want to point out that Maccabees 1 emphasizes the military aspect. Maccabees 2 emphasizes the martyrdom and the spiritual heroism. Okay, but now let's go to the story of Hanukkah. So, on the 25th of Kislev, they regained the Beit HaMikdash. Tremendous joy, tremendous ability to serve Hashem once more. A victory of ruchnius, a victory of spirituality. So, Maccabees 1 says they established an eight-day holiday because they celebrated dedicating the Beit HaMikdash for eight days just as the tabernacle, the Mishkan in the Midbar, was dedicated for eight days in Moshe Rabbeinu, so too Hanukkah, in fact, the word Hanukkah, the word Hanukkah means dedication. Hanukkah was an eight-day holiday celebrating the reclaiming and the rededication of the Beit HaMikdash after it had been desecrated by the Yivanim. Now, note what it does not say. It does not say in the book of the Maccabees anything about finding oil. It does not say anything about a miracle lasting eight days. Hanukkah is eight days because Chanukat Habayit was eight days as it was in the day of Moshe Rabbeinu. So according to Maccabees 1, Hanukkah was an eight-day festival to celebrate the victory over the Yivanim and the rededication of the Beit HaMikdash. That's what Maccabees 1 says. Maccabees 2 adds something else that's a bit peculiar. And it says that that year, Sukkot was not celebrated, obviously. Or Sukkot was not celebrated in the Beit HaMikdash because the Beit HaMikdash was under the custody of the Yivanim. 
So Hanukkah, now Sukkot is really an eight-day festival. It's seven days of Sukkot, followed by, it's a, it's a separate Chag, but right away, right afterwards, is the Chag of Shemini Atzeret. So Hanukkah was enacted as an eight-day festival to be a communal makeup for the fact that Sukkot was not celebrated that year in the Beit HaMikdash. Ad Kedekach, that in Maccabees too, there was something that halachically is very bizarre, that people made Sukkot and they took Lulav and Esra for the seven of the eight days of Hanukkah to make up for Sukkot. <laughs> Now, halachically, there is, of course, no such thing. And they, as they say, the Book of Maccabees are not halachic documents. They are not rabbinic documents. But they, they may be expressing folk traditions, things that people were doing, even if it did not have the sanction of the Chachamim. But Lani Astati, although in Chazal there is absolutely no reference to Hanukkah being a makeup for Sukkot, sometimes, even Min Hagim that Chazal wanted to crush, they consider them to be inauthentic, manage to have a life of their own and survive in some attenuated forms. And let me give you a, an example of this. There's a famous argument between Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai. How do you celebrate the Hanukkah lighting? Beit Shammai says, night one, you start with one candle and you add a candle every night. Till you, I'm, I'm sorry, Beit Hillel says, you start with one candle and you add every night, which is what, exactly what we do. But Beis Shammai has an unusual procedure. Beis Shammai says you start with eight and you go down. And the Gemara wonders, like, why, is, why does Beis Shammai say what he says? But one of the reasons that Beis Shammai gives is that the Hanukkah candles should follow the pattern of the korbanot, of the bulls that are brought on Sukkot. The korbanos that are brought on Sukkot are brought in a descending order. The first day of Sukkot, you bring 13, and then you go down. So Beishamai says, the same way the Sukkot offerings go down, the Hanukkah candles go down. Now this is an enigmatic passage. Okay, Sukkot goes down. But by what association would you therefore say the ritual of Hanukkah should be connected to Sukkot? So my speculation, I did not see it anywhere, is that this is the sole survival in rabbinic literature of the folk tradition in Maccabees number two, that Hanukkah was on some level a makeup for Sukkot, and therefore Beit Shammai at least, we don't ask him like Beit Shammai, Beit Shammai maintained that the pattern of the candle lighting should follow the Korbanus of Sukkot. So, so far, both in Maccabees 1 and in Maccabees 2, there is no reference to a jar of oil that was found that miraculously burnt for eight days. If we ask the Kasha, why is there an eight-day festival of Hanukkah? According to Maccabees 1, it is a celebration of a military victory combined with the dedication of the Beis HaMikdash. And according to Maccabees too, it is a somehow a spiritual makeup for the holiday of Sukkot. So where do we find, for the very first time, a record at least? Again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not suggesting things were made up. In other words, I, I believe there, of course, was such a miracle, but it was not given as the reason for the Chag. The first document that describes the story of finding a jar of oil that burnt for eight days is in a sefer that was written more than a hundred years after the Hanukkah story, actually close to 200 years after the Hanukkah story, and this is the sefer called Megillas Tanis. Now Megillas Tanis is earlier than the Mishnah. The Mishnah is from the year 200. Megillas Tanis is maybe a hundred years earlier but that would make it 100 CE, and the Hanukkah story is 185 BCE. So this is uh, uh, almost 300 years later, right? 300 years later. Uh, and it's different than Masechus Tanis? Yes, it is, absolutely. It is not Masechus Tanis. Megillas Tanis is a document that lists 
all of the festive days where you're not allowed to fast, not allowed to fast, and not allowed to eulogize. It does not list Torah holidays. It lists various rabbinic holidays. And it lists Hanukkah as a rabbinic holiday where you're not allowed to fast. And it says the following. It gives the familiar story that we know that is quoted in the Gemara, but the Gemara is quoting this older document called Megillah Astanis, that when we finally liberated the Beit HaMikdash that had been desecrated, there was a jar of oil uh, that was sealed with the seal of the Kohen Gadol. All the other oil had become Tame, and this oil only had enough to burn for one day. And a miracle happened, and it burned for eight days. And to commemorate that great miracle, we celebrate by lighting candles to commemorate the miracle of Hanukkah. And that is the reason that the Gemara gives. That's the reason the Gemara gives. And that's the most familiar reason that we give for Hanukkah. Which means, when I say Hanukkah version 1 and Hanukkah version 2, I mean that Hanukkah version 1 was a celebration of a military victory coupled with dedication of the Beis HaMikdash, or was connected to Sukkos. Hanukkah version 2, which was not emphasized, again, I'm, I'm not saying it was made up, uh, but, but that story was not emphasized until 200 or 200, you know, almost 300 years uh, later, in which the emphasis shifted from the Nitzachon of the Milchama and the Chanukah Tabayat to the idea of the miracle of the Pach Hashemen. There was a redefinition of the Chag. Now let me just mention one thing. One of the most famous questions about Hanukkah is a question of Rav Yosef Karo. Famous, famous question. And that is, if the miracle of Hanukkah was that the oil burnt uh, eight days when there was only enough for one day, then Hanukkah should only be celebrated for seven days because the first day was not a miracle. Right? The famous, famous question. And I know there are, there are at least 500 answers to this question because I saw a safer, I didn't get it yet, but I saw a safer that has 500 answers. Mm -hmm. And that's great inflation because last year I saw a safer that only had 125 answers. Mm -hmm. So somebody decided, it's like the Guinness Book of World Records, uh, oh, you know, you have 125, I'll make it 500. That's going to be a record that's going to be hard to beat, uh, 500 answers. Uh, but let me point out, that according to the book of Maccabees, either one or two, the question doesn't even start. Because the reason Hanukkah is eight days, according to the Maccabees one and two, which are the earlier sources, are not because of a miraculous burning of the menorah for eight days. It is because the Hanukkah Tamikdash is eight days, or Sukkot is eight days, which means it's there. So it's interesting that the Sefer HaMakabim furnishes a very, very compelling and simple answer. <coughs> to the famous, famous question of Rav Yosef Cairo. The eight days of Hanukkah comes from Hanukkah 1. It doesn't come from Hanukkah 2. Now, interestingly enough, the Maharal of Prague, who wrote a beautiful, beautiful book on Hanukkah, it's called the Ner Mitzvah, and the Maharal did not have access to the Book of the Maccabees, the Maharal didn't read the Book of the Maccabees, but the Maharal on his own actually offers this as a terrace. The Maharal actually says the following perspective in which he links the two. He says, Hanukkah is not a celebration of the miracle of the oil. Because we don't make holidays over miracles. I mean, for example, we make holidays over God redeeming us from an enemy that wants to destroy us. Yeah, a miracle happened. I mean, I mean there are a lot of miracles. For example, let me give you an example. Hanina ben Dosa was a righteous person. He was very poor. His wife did not have oil for Shabbos candles. And he said to his wife, light with vinegar. And when she said, vinegar doesn't burn, he said, the same God who can make oil burn can make vinegar burn. So there was a miracle. Do we make a yumtif because Hanina ben Dosa's wife was able to light vinegar? In other words, there are plenty. not a bad idea. Well, OK, that's good. But Maral makes a point. We don't make a yumtif every time there's a miracle. We make a yumtif when as a result of that miracle, God saved us. So the morale says, it's a davar pashut that the holiday of Hanukkah 
is because we were liberated from the Yavanim and were able to serve Hashem. It's not Stam that we found a jar of oil and the oil burnt. There are plenty of miracles that don't have holidays. But the Maral says, the reason why we have to link the military victory to the oil is because otherwise we might attribute the victory to our own prowess. So I need the oil to keep in mind the supernatural idea that it was God that gave us Nitzachat. So really the Maral himself was Mechaven to the book of Maccabees that the eight days of Hanukkah is not because of the miracle of the oil, but the miracle of the oil gives us a perspective on the source of our Nitzachon that we shouldn't attribute our success to what the Torah calls Kochi V'yotzim V'yotzim Yadi. Yeah. Um, was the Anshei Knesset Gadol responsible for al -Anisim? Did it come later? What exactly no, al is, the... is very early, and, and this is a famous question. So, People ask yeah. this question all the time. In the al Hanisim prayer that we recite, both in the Shemona Esrei and in Birkas HaMazam, you will note there is no mention of the Hanukkah miracle of the oil. It mentions they lit candles, but that just means they rededicated the temple and lit the menorah. It doesn't say there was any miracle. The whole al Anisim is about how Hashem gave us the power. The pure defeated the impure. The few defeated the many. The tzaddikim defeated the rishayim. The, those who kept the Torah were able to overcome the people who wanted to destroy the Torah. So who that? The whole al Hanisen is about the victory. Now again, not just the political victory, but the, vic the spiritual victory of the primacy of Torah. But it's not about the Pach Hashem. And, and, and the point basically is that the al Hanisen dates as old as the Book of the Maccabees. Uh, very, very old. And at that point in time, the Pach Hashem was a miracle, but it was not the reason for the holiday. So it was written in Hebrew. It's authoritative. Yep. yep. I'm just asking, like, who actually was it around the time of the Anshei Well, uh, it's got to be a question because there was there was no. <laughs> by the time of the Hanukkah story, there was no Anshei Knesset. Yes, that was already finished. Right? They're already finished. Okay. So we have to assume it was the Sanhedrin, the uh, of Chazal, right? So Chazal. So, so the point is Al Hanisim is Maccabees 1, I'm sorry, is Hanukkah 1, Hanukkah version 1. So the question becomes, why did Megillas Tanis and the Babylonian Talmud change the emphasis of Hanukkah to emphasize the Hadlaka Tanerot? And the answer is, because in retrospect, Malchus Chashmonai turned out to be a bust. Because here is the problem. The, uh, those of you that uh, ever read uh, George Orwell's uh, Animal Farm. George Orwell's Animal Farm is a parody of the Russian Revolution. If you remember the story, it's just a, it's a, just a story about animals revolting against an oppressive uh, human system to establish liberty and freedom for all the animals. And what happens is that some of the animals themselves become dictators and they're actually more repressive than the human beings that they overthrew. And Orwell was making the point that, you know, uh, the average Russian uh, citizen did not do better under Lenin or Stalin than they were under the, uh, under the Tsar. And of course, the Robespierre, the French Revolution, uh, Phnom Penh, not Phnom Penh, uh, Paul, uh, what's the guy's name? Oh. Uh, Paul Pope. Paul. Yeah, Paul Pat. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the, these are people who are rebelling and overthrowing authority to establish greater freedom, and they wind up being, you know, mass murderers of unbelievable, unbelievable proportion. I mean, Mao Zedong, you know, whatever it is. This is the history of revolutions. <coughs> now, some say there are exceptions. The American Revolution, you know, whatever it is. Some people aren't even with that, but okay. Uh, but, but say there. Uh, well, what happened was that this happened to the Hashmonai they became the very thing they fought against. Why did the Maccabees fight? They didn't fight for political independence. They fought to be able to keep the Torah, to be able to keep the mitzvahs. Uh, had Antiochus not made his decrees, they would have been content, at least for the time being, to remain under Greek domination. They fought for the primacy of Torah. 
They fought to be able to keep Hashem's will, and if they had to engage in military combat, they did so. But they then established their own monarchy, a Jewish state, an independent Jewish state. But what happened in the passage of time is the Malchei Hashmonai themselves became Hellenist. They became persecutors, Yanai HaMelech, etc., became persecutors of the Chachamim. Many Chachamim had to go in hiding. Many Chachamim were killed. They became Hellenists. Now, it's very strange. Why did that happen? The Ramban points out in Chumash that the Makabim, the Chashmonoyim, were tzadikei el yom. They were righteous. They were pure. Their motives were totally l'shem shemayim. And yet their descendants became the very enemy that the Chashmonoyim were trying to overthrow. By the way, it's always a little bit of an, uh, kind of a funny anomaly, I mean, you know, that um, you know the, the the Jewish substitute for the Olympics is called the Maccabee Games. Now it, it's it's so funny. <laughs> yeah, you know, again, there's nothing wrong with athletics, but but the point is the whole athletic, the Olympics is kind of taken from Greek uh, culture. <laughs> so you put the Maccabees with something that is adapted from Greek culture when the Maccabees were fighting against all of the Greek uh, culture uh, and, and the like. But what happened to the Chashmonayim? What happened? And Akkadei Kachlin, eventually, by the way, the whole Hasmonean dynasty was wiped out by the time of Herod. There literally was no survivor at all. So the Ramban has a whole arichas. The Ramban suggests that the Chashmonayim should never have made themselves monarchs, that even though once the military victory was achieved, they should have found a descendant of David HaMelech, of the Davidic line, Lo Yasur Shevet Mi Yehuda. The Ramban also points out there's a special sin that a Kohen should not be a Melech. You need to have, it's very fascinating, you need to have separation of church and state, even in a Torah society. And that is, the Kohen is the spiritual teacher, he should not be involved in politics. That's an interesting lesson for the state of Israel uh, today, because the Ramban says that when religious leaders are involved in political decision making, they get corrupted and are no longer a voice of Torah and uh, Ruchniyat, etc. By the way, the Pope even recognized this, uh, uh, not this one, but two popes ago, uh, John Paul II, issued a takana or gezerah around uh, 20 years ago that no ordained Catholic clergy could serve in any government position. Mm. And uh, I know in Washington, D.C., there was a congressman, Robert Drinan, who was a priest, and uh, he had been in Congress for almost 30 years. And he had to resign his seat because you know, the Pope uh, decreed that no priest can be in, in politics. Well, uh, the MS is, that's what the Ramban says. But whatever it is, in retrospect, the Chashmonayim was a failed rebellion. It was failed in, in, in a number of ways. Even politically it was failed, because after 150 years, the Romans conquered them. So by the time the Mishnah and the Gemara is written, the Beis HaMikdash is destroyed. There's no, we're under Roman domination. So what did the Chashmonaim accomplish? Politically they accomplished very little. But even more importantly, spiritually, the very thing that they wanted to establish with their rebellion turned out to be a failure. As a result, the concept that Hanukkah should be a celebration of Malchut Chashmonai, the military conquest, that no longer worked. Because if the military conquest would have created a society of Torah, Ruchniyat, etc., that would have been worthy of celebration. So as a result, the initial celebration may have focused on the Hasmonean dynasty, because of the hope. You know, it's similar in a way, uh, you know, uh, Obama, uh, President Obama, former President Obama, won the Nobel Peace Prize, I don't know, I mean, 10 years ago or something. Uh, and nobody really knows why. Uh, there was no particular, there was no particular accomplishment at all. But the common explanation was that the Nobel Committee saw in him promise and potential. Mm -hmm. And they were actually awarding potential rather than actualization of potential. That's an interesting criterion for awarding a prize, but okay. Uh, so in many, many ways, 
Hanukkah version one was a celebration of a potential that could have been. But by the time Chazal codified these laws in the Mishnah and in the Gemara, that potential was seen to be unactualized. And it was a failure politically, it was a failure spiritually, and therefore the emphasis changed to the miracle of the Pach Hashem. And that is why the emphasis of Hanukkah changes. Neither aspect disappears. The Alanism still talks about the fact that God gives us victory over the enemies that try to destroy us, but the emphasis changed. Now, you can also give a simpler reason why the emphasis changed, and that is, once Eretz Yisrael became under Roman domination, it was actually dangerous to, I mean, we're lighting Hanukkah candles. So some Roman guy walks by and says, why are you lighting Hanukkah candles? Oh, we're doing it to celebrate the overthrow of foreign domination in Eretz Yisrael. Uh, it is not a politically correct uh, holiday when you are under foreign domination. So one might give a simple reason that the, 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 the emphasis of Hanukkah had to change when we were under foreign domination, which might mean that here in the state of Israel we could go back to Hanukkah version one, but you also have this other reason, that in a more basic way, Chazal had enormous, for good reason, they had enormous hostility to Malchus Chashmanai. It was already the immediate yeah. year following that they instituted the lighting of the candles, correct? Yes, that, that's correct, but, but, but that was still version one. In other words, uh, like the Maral says, Chazal had tremendous hostility towards Malchus Chashmanai. And they just regarded it as a continuation of Greek domination. They did not regard it as a Jewish state. They did not, they did not regard Malchei Chashmanai as a Jewish state. They regarded it as a non-Jewish state in which the rulers happened to have been born Jews. And as a result, they did not see anything to celebrate. And as I say, Chazal had plenty of good reasons for this, because uh, <coughs> the Malchei Chashmanai, after the first generation, were active persecutors of rabbinic Judaism. And uh, many, many great uh, rabbis had to go in hiding, literally, they had to go in hiding. Uh, the only bright light was Shalom Tzion Amalka, again, uh, which is so fascinating, because according to Halacha, a woman is not supposed to be the head of state. We darshan melech below Malka. And yet, the only righteous Hasmonean ruler was Shalom Tzion Amalka. It happened to be her brother was Shimon ben Shetach, the head of the Sanhedrin. And only when her husband died, Yana Melech died, and she became a queen, that was considered to be the golden age within Malchus Chashmonai of the flourishing of religion and, and, and Torah. So <laughs> it's so fascinating that Badafka, the ruler who didn't have halachic entitlement uh, to rule, was the one who did the most for uh, Judaism and Torah in Eretz Yisrael. That, that's correct. No, you, you, you actually, you are, you are correct. In other words, it was no, <laughs> she was no worse than, uh, than the, the Chashmonaim themselves, who didn't have the right to be Melech. But this is why Hanukkah underwent this metamorphosis, and that, that's why it's so fascinating. Now, I will say that it's interesting that when the Rambam describes the holiday of Hanukkah, the Rambam does go back to what I call Hanukkah version one. He says, it was a wonderful thing that the Malchus was returned to the Jewish people for more than 200 years. The Rambam sees the establishment of Jewish sovereignty as a reason to have a chat. This has interesting implications for Yom HaTzmoot, right? As you know, obviously in the different segments of Israeli society, there are different attitudes regarding celebration of Yom Matzimot. In fact, uh, even in the American rabbinate, any rabbi that's up for an interview for a job, one of the interview questions will always be, you know, what is your position on Yom Matzimot? And uh, the rabbi will sometimes say, well, uh, what do you want me to do? <laughs> I can go either way on it. Uh, but so people say, well, non-religious state, you know, you know, whatever. I don't want to go over the, the different arguments people have. But what's interesting is this passage in the Rambam is very, very instructive, because the Rambam says the fact that shilton ribonutz 
was returned to the Jewish people for a period of 200 years or more is a cause to celebrate. Now the Rambam is referring to Malchus Chashmanoi, which was a lot more anti-religious, we'll say, than the state, uh, the state of Israel is. And yet the Rambam said the fact that it's in Jewish hands was considered to be a cause for celebration. So I actually think that that is a very significant text in terms of how we would regard uh, Yom HaTzmod. Uh, they also disagree with the Rambam about the right of the Benzabitians. The, the right of the what? The right of them to be at Malchus. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm not, well, well, let me put it to you. He quotes the Shulamir. Right, right. It was from Binyamin, it wasn't from you, was it? Well, yeah, but the Rambam uh, gives a reason. The Rambam says that Malchus does belong to Yehuda, but Shulamir was from Binyamin because since the Jewish people requested a king, in a very improper way, Hashem gave them kind of an improper king. That, that, that's what the, the Rambam was. A prophet, a prophet appointed the show. Yes, but it was a getter of an onish. That's what he's saying. That, that God is showing his displeasure with the people by giving them somebody not from, from you. Now, I just want to uh, mention one thing. Uh, if we put aside the Hanukkah 1 and Hanukkah 2, which I think is a very, very fascinating point in how the meaning of a holiday can emerge differently in different times. And Hanukkah 1 was based on a potentiality that could have been achieved. And Hanukkah 2 is a realization that that potentiality never panned out. And therefore, we emphasize something else. But let me go back to the Beis Yosef's question. Right? Beis Yosef asks a simple question. If the eight days of Hanukkah is because of the miracle of the oil, which Megillah Tanis says it is, so why is it eight days? Let it be seven days, because the first day was no miracle. So let me give you a Terence I, I once heard from the uh, former Rav Rashi, Rav Yisrael Mayor Lau, uh, who now uh, is the Rav of Tel Aviv, works for his son, Rav David Lau, who's the Rav Rashi. I'm sure uh, uh, when a father has to work for his son in that way, there's a lot of nachas and doing it. Uh, I also think that probably being the Rav of Tel Aviv is probably a harder job than being the Rav Rashi. I guess whatever. I think uh, when you're in a city, you're involved in more of a nitty gritty daily stuff, but okay. Be it as it may, you may know Rav Lau's story. Rav Lau, uh, as a child, was in a concentration camp. I think he was like four or five, very, very young. And if he would be discovered by the Nazis, they would kill him on the spot. They did not allow little children to hang around in concentration camps. So his older brother, who just nifted a few years ago, would drag him around in a bag, basically, just, just kept him with him all the time. Uh, and the Nazis didn't discover it for two years or so. It was really an amazing thing. And Rav Lau uh, would say that this was absolutely a miracle hmm. because it would have been so easy for them to look for him and they would, if they would have looked, they would have found. So the miracle he experienced, he said, was they didn't look. So Rav Lau wanted to apply this to Hanukkah in reverse. The miracle of the first day was that they bothered to look for pure oil. Why did they bother to look? There was plenty of impure oil. And halakhically, actually, they could have even lit, they could have lit the impure oil. This is a principle that is called Tuma Hutra B'tzibor, that for communal offerings, impure quantities can be used. Why did they bother to look? And why did they bother to light? Because let's say they found something. But it's only going to last one day. So by tomorrow, as far as they thought, we're going to have to go with the Tomei stuff anyway because it takes at least seven days to get pure oil. So if we're going to go with Tomei stuff tomorrow anyway, then why bother to do this? And that's a miracle. The miracle was that they went to the effort of doing something that didn't seem to have any prospect of being successful. And yet they did it. And that's the greatest lesson of all. You know, you live in a world of darkness. The world is dark on many, many levels. There is the darkness of ignorance, the darkness of suffering, the darkness of violence and oppression. And each of us has a capacity to light something, bring some light to the world. But our light is so small, and our light is so insignificant, that we often think, <coughs> what's the point? What's the purpose? I'll light my light today, what's going to be tomorrow? And the ultimate and most important lesson of Hanukkah is you do what you can, even if it seems hopeless, fruitless, worthless, 
ineffectual. But when you do what you can, God blesses your efforts beyond what you would have thought was possible. When they found that oil, there was no reason to think it would burn eight days. There was really no reason whatsoever. But you do what you can. Yeah. What's the purpose of lighting it today if it's not, I'm not going to have it tomorrow? Okay. But I got today. I got this minute. I got this time. So that's the great lesson. And that's why Hanukkah is so important. Really, as a lesson for life, you do what you can and you never know the doors that are going to be open. If they wouldn't have lit, the miracle wouldn't have happened. Now, one final historical event that makes this even a more powerful thought. Although I've been discussing the dedication of the temple and the establishment of the Asmonean dynasty as occurring at the same time, that actually is not true. They did regain the base of Mikdash after three years of fighting, but that was not the end of the war. The war continued for more than 20 years. The Jewish state was not established until 20 years after the Hanukkah story. By that time, Yud HaMakabi had died already, Elazar had died, Shimon uh, was the last surviving son of Matisyo, and Shimon was the first Hasmonean king. He called himself Nasi, Shimon, Nasi uh, Yisrael. So think about it this way. The message of the oil is actually a message to the Jewish people, to the Maccabees themselves. Because here they are engaged in a struggle against the most powerful military force in the world. And they too could think, what's the point? Why should we fight? We're going to lose our, you know, our defeat is inevitable on some level. So what does the candle say? Do what you can and I will bless you beyond what you thought possible. You see, having it at the beginning of the struggle is actually much more meaningful than at the end. Had it been at the end, it just would have been a frosting on the cake. But here, it's a message. I'm engaged in a military struggle. I think the odds are hopeless. God gives me a sign. Do what you can, and things are going to happen. By the way, there's a beautiful story with George Washington and Hanukkah. Again, it's, it's an American story, so I apologize for the, uh, the people who aren't American, but, but, it's, a, but it's a beautiful story anyway. Mm -hmm. in which uh, during uh, Valley Forge, which was a very low point in the American Revolution, and the American army, the, the army of the colonies, didn't have food, they didn't have blankets, it was an awful winter in, in Pennsylvania, a lot of snow and, and, and cold, people were dying, and the British had uh, unlimited supplies, they were very well stocked and very well trained, and at one point, Washington was very despondent, and Washington was seriously thinking of just surrendering and accepting British sovereignty. But in his army, there was a Jewish kid, a teenager, who had somehow immigrated from Poland. And he was not religious, uh, but the one thing he got from his mother was, you have to light Hanukkah candles. And he was embarrassed to light Hanukkah candles when people were up, but he waited till 2 o'clock in the morning when everybody was sleeping. And he lit a candle. And... General George Washington is walking by, kind of checking the army, you know, checking for blankets. Like they say with the Chavitz Chaim, he used to go into the base medrash and put blankets on sleeping students. So Washington was doing the same thing, covering people. And he says to this boy, he says, what, uh, what are you doing? He says, this is the candle that the Jewish people light to signify the triumph of light over darkness of good over, over evil, of victory over those who oppress and take away freedom. And he said to Washington, I know that this should also be a symbol for you, that you'll be victorious. And Washington got very excited. Washington said, oh, you Jews are the prophets. You're a prophetic people. You're a prophet. Are you giving me a prophecy? I don't know how the kid could say he was, but he said, yes, I'm giving you a prophecy. And uh, you know, Washington, you know, the war was finished and the United States was uh, victorious or the colonies were victorious, became the United States. So a few years later, uh, Washington is president, and the first capital of the U.S. was in New York. And in those days, there was no secret service. And this uh, boy, this man, is living in New York, and he's lighting Hanukkah in the window. And Washington walks by and knocks on the door and says, I remember you. 
you gave me hope in my darkest moment. And he said, and I made something for you. I, I, I'm glad I found you. I didn't know where you lived. And he said, he gave him a medallion, a gold medallion with a menorah on one side. I, I don't know if it's a true story. You know, they, they say it's true. And it says uh, to the person who gave me light in the middle of the darkness. Mm -hmm. So it's a nice story with George Washington and Hanukkah. And really, I think that's the ultimate lesson here. Because whether it's the military victory, which is emphasized in al Hanisan, or whether it's the miracle of the oil that should have only burnt one day, and it burnt for eight days, the common denominator is we live in a world where our efforts often seem to be ineffectual. But Hanukkah says, your job, our job, is to do what we can do to bring light to the world. And then Hashem blesses our efforts beyond what we thought were possible. But if we didn't make that initial effort, those things would never have happened. So, Be'ezus Hashem, I hope for all of us, Hanukkah should be a time of light and redemption and, and simcha and joy. And uh, may the miracles that Hashem brought to our forefathers continue to be miracles for us. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <laughs>